So last class, last class we were going through, um, <clears throat> we started doing minimum spanning trees. And we had gotten to the point where we had introduced uh, the idea of Trim's algorithm, which was an algorithm for constructing minimum spanning trees, where we basically start from an arbitrary vertex and grow a tree, okay, in, um, gr grow a tree by uh, basically at each iteration finding the vertice that is the edge that links the tree to the um, undiscovered vertices, which is of minimum weight. And we keep cycling on that uh, until we have put every vertex in the tree. And last time we, 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 I went through and, and argued, I hope convincingly, that Prim's algorithm gives you a minimum spanning tree. Not just a spanning tree, but the absolute minimum one. Any questions about that? Any questions about the proof that Prim's algorithm was correct? Does everybody kind of remember this idea? We did a proof by contradiction, which meant that we had a, uh, what do I, Prim's algorithm was not correct, okay? Hold, uh, hold further problems, I don't want any more problems. If uh, we, Prim's algorithm was not correct, there had to be a tree, a graph where Prim's algorithm was wrong. I challenge you to show me that, and basically, by showing where you tell me my algorithm was wrong on the example you say that this did not construct the minimum spanning tree, okay? I basically proved to you that, that no, it did construct a better minimum, uh, you know, that, 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 that it did construct a, a potentially, no, 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 okay? Uh, it did construct a potentially better minimum spanning tree, uh, better spanning tree, because if we looked at the low, at the edge that we added, your minimum spanning tree had to have an edge that I had a chance to add. I thought about adding, but didn't. And since I picked the one of lowest weight, by replacing the one you had with the one I had, that would do it. Okay, no, 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 no. Okay, any questions? No, 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 no. Okay, any questions? Okay. Um, any questions about the proof of Prim's algorithm, why Prim's algorithm is correct? How many people understand the proof? Are there any mysteries here about the proof? Okay, fair enough. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, what I want to do now, however, is to talk, because there is one thing that I haven't discussed that is important, okay, which is how fast is Prim's algorithm? And I want to talk about, uh, I want us to actually look at the implementation, because this is one where, first, when it comes time to thinking about an algorithm, an algorithm is an idea or an approach, and at the level we've described Prim's algorithm over here, it's a fairly simple idea. Always select the minimum edge that is, uh, spans sort of what is in the tree and what is not in the tree. And that was kind of basically what the iteration here is. It should be clear, if you do this in a, let's say, brute force kind of way without, you know, you know sp as straightforward as you can, there are, no, 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 any n iterations, okay? Uh, okay, because we're going to be taking one leaf, uh, one tree node at a time, okay? And in each case, we need to find the uh, edge that, of minimum weight, that goes between a tree node and a non-tree node. Okay, does everybody kind of get that idea? Now what is the easiest way we can do the bookkeeping so that this would be a fast thing to do, okay? So if you wanted to be able to, how could you go through, we would like this, let's say I would like in order m time to be able to go through, n plus m time, you know, you know adjacency search list walkover type of thing. How would I go about doing the bookkeeping so I can select the edge of minimum weight that spans the two trees, that spans a vertex one in the tree and one outside the tree? How can we do that? Let's be precise about that. Any ideas? What data structure do we need to do it? Okay. Or let's see, do you see what the problem is? First, it should be obvious that if I want to say, go through all the edges and find the minimum weight one, that should be something that you guys say, yeah, I know how to do that. 
for i equals 1 to n, while the list is not nil, walk down the list. If this edge is smaller than the smallest I've seen, keep track of it. Does everybody kind of see that one? So finding the minimum edge okay, in an adjacency list should not be hard. How do we find the minimum with the property that it spans in one vertex in the tree and one vertex out the tree? How can we do that test quickly? Okay, yeah? Okay, you're saying min heap of the fringe. Now maybe we're talking about something magical. Okay, first of all, I'm willing to do it in order n plus m time. Okay, so the, 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 what you're saying that sounds like a reasonable thing is, hey, I want the minimum edge. Heaps are good for minimum th finding minimum things, right? But the question now is, how do we do the bookkeeping so that we can tell whether an edge is one edge in a tree and one edge out of the tree. What would be a data structure for that? Use like a bit vector. No, no, no. OK? Bit vector. Suppose we have an array in tree that is a Boolean thing. OK? And for i equals 1 to n, we maintain true or false depending upon whether the vertex is currently in the tree. Does everybody see that? Now, what does it take as you walk through? Here you have in the adjacency list. As you walk through the ith list, and you encounter vertex j, and you discover its weight is very, very small, OK? How do we know whether this edge spans the, uh, what you call it, spans being in the tree and out the tree? How do we do it? We basically check whether the ith value of this bit vector differs is not equal to the jth value of the bit vector. Does everybody see that? Every vertex is either in and out. If the if I if entry of i is not the same as entry of j, we have found a span a fringe edge. Okay? Any questions about that? That's got to be concrete. I want to make sure people see it. So now they say, yeah, I see how in a very simple way, in order m time, I could cruise through all the n plus m time. I could cruise through all the edges of the graph, find which one is minimum that spans in and out. Any questions about that? Question like, I don't see it is a good question. Any questions? OK, good. Now, what I'm going to claim here is, if we think about it, do we really need to look through all the edges, OK, going through th that in the graph in order to find the edges that, as we talk about, again, what's our basic vision? We've got a tree so far. There are vertices that are outside this. There are edges that kind of cross. We really would just like to look at the edges with the property that one vertex is in the tree and one vertex is out of the tree. Does everybody see that? How might we do that? Can anybody suggest a way to do it? OK. To speed up this inner loop that we want to do. OK. So that we're going to select, instead of looking at all, going through all the, the uh, edges in the graph, we're only going to go through the ones that might actually help us. Any ideas? I want people to think about this. This shouldn't be that. Well, any ideas how you might do it? OK, yes. OK, does everybody see one way that we could do it, or looks like we could do it? would be, what if instead of our paradigm to look for all the edges, OK, we go, instead of going 4i goes from 1 to n, cruise down the list, 4i goes from 1 to n, if, what you call it, uh, maybe only look at the list where one of them is true, right? And then we would be looking at these, and then only accept the edges that are false. Does everybody see that? So that's an idea you're going to do less work. 
It turns out that's not quite enough for what we would like to get an asymptotic improvement. How many of the edges would we probably not have to not look at? What, how would we reduce the amount of edges in general as an idea if we only looked at the lists of the true vertices on average? How many of the edges would we not have to look at? Yeah? About half. Does everybody see that? So that isn't enough to give us the big O kind of an improvement. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Any questions? Yeah. So what are we saying here? He's saying that we need to look at the edge with the property, that it goes from true to false, OK, uh, that is of minimum weight. Before, we had looked at all pairs of edges, all vertices, and looked at all adjacency lists and looked to see if this um, if, if the, the, the sign of this vertex was different than the sign of that vertex. The potential improvement was to just look at the vertices that were true and then basically go through those lists and look for only for ones that were false. Every edge would show up basically that way. But we agree we would only throw out about half the edges in the graph. So that's not a big O improvement. Any questions about that? So let's think about how we can do better. Um, what we're going to do better, OK, and, and maybe I sh I'll show you the code, but it's going to be a different kind of an a slightly different idea here. What we're going to do is, if we looked at this picture, there was a tree, there were vertices that were, um, what you call it, uh, that were, uh, you know, basically nodes in the tr vertices in the tree. Then there are vertices that are in the fringe. Okay, the fringe I define as being in the, not in the tree, but have at least one neighbor that's in the tree. Does so everybody see that, 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 that once we have a tree, there's going to be some vertices that are in the fringe. Some guys may be really far out. Does everybody see it? Now, what we would like to do, what we're going to do instead, for every one of the fringe vertices, OK, or equivalently for any one of the non-tree vertices, what if we only keep track of the cheapest edge that connects it to the tree? OK? So this vertex here might have several edges to the, uh, into the graph. But what if we have a data structure that keeps track of what is the cheapest edge so far that links this vertex back into the tree? For all of these guys, there is no cheapest edge, right? So the cost of these are going to be infinite, right? But what if we just keep track for every vertex? What is its cheapest way of getting into the tray? If we have that, what is the next vertex that we should pick for Prim's algorithm? OK. The one? that has the, where these edges that link it to the tree, if we just look at these edges, the, the lightest of those edges are the ones that get us into the tree, correct? Does everybody see that? How many edges are there potentially being the lightest? For every vertex, how many lightest ways are there to get it I into the tree? By definition, one. If there's a tie, we don't care which one we take, right? Now then, checking the next vertex to add should be just checking these at most n edges rather than m edges. Does everybody kind of get that idea? If for every edge I already know the cheapest way to get it into the tree, every vertex I know the cheapest way to get it into the tree, then I want to take the smallest one of these guys. Does everybody see that? So now I'm looking through n things instead of m things. But what happens once I do decide to add this guy to the tree? OK. What's now going to change, yeah? I have more vertices that might be reachable, OK? But more than that, I might have a cheaper way to get to some of the old vertices that were reachable. Does everybody kind of see that? This might have been costing four. This guy is costing three. 
Now this is going to be a cheaper way to get this guy into the tree. Does everybody see that? So what is the bookkeeping we're going to do? We're going to go through now n rounds of, instead of looking at all edges, what we're going to do is n rounds of, find what is the smallest guy to add, and then update the consequences of having added this guy. OK? So let's look at my code. And I want you to try to understand the code here. OK, Prim's algorithm. I'm going to have a couple of different um, data structures. In tree was that Boolean thing to tell me whether the vertex is in the tree or not. Dist is an array on the number of vertices that will tell me what is the cost of adding this guy to, what is the best way I have so far of adding this vertex to the tree? Does everybody see that? And now what am I going to do? Initializing this thing, no vertex is in the tray. The distance to add every vertex is infinite. And the parent relation, which kind of as we saw before in depth first search and breadth first search, is going to show us how we discover edges. Right? And in this case, all we, with minimum spanning tree, all we care about is the tray. So once we have the parent relation for every vertex, we've got our tray. Any questions? Now, what is the, um, what you call it, the uh, thing? We're going to say, well, v is our starting vertex, so let's start. While v is not in the tree, OK, let's add v to the tree. Does everybody see that? I guess, oh, here, I can go to my uh, laser thing. Hold on. Here you go. Let's see if I can do this without blinding anyone. OK, while we put the th vertex is now in the tree, OK? And we're going to now say, now that I'm in the tree, let me update the cost of adding other guys potentially to the tree. I'm going to go through V's adjacency list. That's what this is doing, right? And noticing that I find the weight of, for, for the next vertex, Y. This is a, 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 a ver an edge of the form VY because y is on v's adjacency list. We keep the, uh, wh uh, what you call it, the, um, what you call it, the uh, weight of that edge. If the weight of this edge, OK, is less than the cheapest way we know of so far to link vert this vertex to the, uh, to the um, tree, then what we're going to do is say, now the weight is the cheapest way to link it to the tree. And if we decide to, tr to link it, the way we linked it was through V. Any questions about that? Does everybody see that? The only thing I said wrong was confusing V and W. Okay, so W is going to be the name of the, neighbor of the neighboring vertex. Our edge is going to be VW, right? And we're going to say that the weight of that edge, is gonna, of edge VW is, is weight. If the cheapest way to get W into the tree so far is bigger than the weight, and W is not in the tree, then darn it, we'd better f we found a cheaper way to get W in the tree if we want it. And the discoverer of this is going to be V. Any questions? So with this in mind, we can, no, 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 no. In, in this case, the, uh, what you call it, the, um, what you call it, the, the, uh, uh, OK, in this case, we go through n iterations, OK? Well, we, we go through the length of our adjacency list. And in that time, we're going to update the counts of all outgoing edges from w. Any questions about that? OK. What's the second set of loops here? Now we want to find which is the smallest next vertex to add. Which one is going to be the smallest next vertex? It's going to be the vertex with the property that it is not in the tree so far, and the distance of it is minimal over all ones that are not in the tree so far. So we're going to go through all vertices, i. If i is not in the tree, and the distance to i is better than the best distance I know of so far from somebody not in the tree, then this is my candidate. And after looking at all n of them, I find my candidate. OK, any questions about that? How many people see what this routine is doing? 
Any questions about it? Okay. So what is the running time of this algorithm? Can anybody tell me what the running time of this algorithm is? Okay. Well, how do we analyze it? There's an outer loop that's going to cover how many times did this did we add vertices? That was n times, right? And within that, we're going to have to go through all the neighbors of this vertex, which of which there are at most n. And then we're going to have to go through all n vertices and find which one is the closest of the guys that aren't in there. Because these tests are constant time, this is going to be n times n plus n. Does everybody see that? So what is the running time of this thing? n squared. Does everybody see that? Prim's algorithm is an n squared algorithm for um, what you call it, for finding the minimum spanning tree. Any questions? OK. Now, there was some idea here about maybe making this even faster. What would that idea be? Is there anyone who will commit to an idea that they thought might have led to a faster way of doing this? OK. You had such an idea. What was your idea? You're saying we want to have a min thing. Does everybody see it? We want to be able to repeatedly find the minimum of things. Where, we do, where would we want to plug a heap in here, possibly? It's not quite going to work, but it's a good idea. And I want us to look at that for a second. Where would we be plugging the heap in? Which part? Is it the heap issue, the top thing, or the bottom thing? Here, we're finding the minimum of the ways to link in everything that is uh, what you call it. We want, this is basically going to be saying to me, find the nearest, uh, what's it, the nearest vertex that isn't in the tree, right? So if this was a heap here, if we somehow had a heap recording those distances. Does everybody see how this would be order log n over here instead of order n, right? So that seems like a good thing. In order to do that, we have to update, however, the thing that's going to make it more complicated a little bit is that here we have to update many vertices, right, with, with making them, um, what you call it, cheaper than they were, right? And so there's going to have to be more bookkeeping than we can just do with a heap, right? Because we've got to put guys in the middle and say, oh, you're getting cheaper, and readjust it. But the basic idea with powerful enough data structures does lead to a faster implementation. OK? Any questions? OK? Yeah? Does that reduce the, um, at the bottom complexity? That, if you use the right data structures, there are more macho data structures than I want to talk about in here. but. Again, it should be clear that they are heap data type data structures, right? That's clearly what you want to do. You want to have a heap data structure to do this kind of thing with something that was going to be efficient for you to lower the weight of, of an item. Does everybody see that? In a heap, how would you lower the weight of an item? You know, as we've talked about it, that wasn't one of our operations on a heap, was it? OK, we had the ability to delete the, minima, the, max, the minimum element. We had the ability to insert a new guy in there. OK? But we didn't really have a way to update values efficiently. OK? If we use a macho enough version of a heap that do, does that well, OK, then we can, in fact, get an asymptotic improvement that, 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 that ends up making it more like an m log, you know, have a log in there instead of one of the ends. Yes? OK, well, now when you start telling me, oh, I'm going to use something that's a mix of a hash table and heaps and stuff like that, what does it cost to take? How much time does it take to do anything in a hash table? If we're talking worst case time, the answer is bad. OK? OK, I don't want us to get too distracted by this. My lesson here is you should be able to catch a whiff that this is the kind of thing you would like to use a heap for if you could. Right? That's what I kind of want. This is a heap, heapy kind of thing to do. OK? And that uh, there, there's a little bit different bookkeeping here than we're doing than in the conventional thing. But uh, the other big picture is that this gives you an n-squared implementation of Prim's algorithm. 
And so Prim's algorithm can be computed in n squared time. Any questions about that? Any questions about how Prim's algorithm works or why it's n squared? OK. Now, is Prim's algorithm, can you beat Prim's algorithm on dense graphs? OK, Prim's algorithm is n squared time, right? Does everybody see that? Could we beat Prim's algorithm on a dense graph? Yeah? I think you can match it with the matrix, but probably not beat it. Well, the claim is that there's no way you could do better than Prim's algorithm on a, uh, what you call it, on a sufficiently dense graph. Why is it? Does everybody agree that how many edges can you have in a dense graph on n vertices? n squared. N squared. Is it possible you could find the minimum spanning tree on a graph without even looking at every edge once? I would say no, right? What if you don't look at this one, and this one has weight minus infinity, right? You would have been really dumb not to have picked that edge, right? So the claim here is we've got, in some sense, a best case algorithm, the best possible algorithm if the graph is dense, OK? But as we have seen, that not all graphs are dense, right? We would like to have an algorithm where instead of it being um, n squared, it was m something, OK? That it was less than n squared for the case of m being n squared, OK? Any questions about that? And so there's going to be another algorithm that's used to find minimum spanning trees that I want us to talk through a little bit. I don't think I'm going to give it to you in all its in, in the, the coding level details, but I want you to understand this other way of computing minimum spanning trees called Kruskal's algorithm. Um, now, Kruskal's algorithm is also going to be a greedy algorithm. Okay? The way Prim's algorithm worked, remember, was that it was growing a tree by basically finding what was the, the edge that would enlarge my tree okay, at cheapest cost. Kruskal's algorithm is different. It's going to be asking for the, the repeatedly add edges, but it's always going to seek the smallest edge that does not create a cycle. There's not going to be a tree notion in that thing. So let's, at the risk of, again, me hurting myself, let's try this thing again. What if we wanted to build a spanning tree? Hopefully this is going to be here. What if we have a weighted graph here, and we wanted to have the property that we were going to build a tree by repeatedly taking the, an edge of lowest weight that didn't create a cycle? What edge is of lowest weight so far? Two. Which one do I want to take first? Doesn't matter. Which one do we like, the left one or the right one? Right one said, said it louder, OK? And I, OK. Boom, we've got that edge. Now, what is the edge of cheapest cost that we can add that won't create a cycle? Two also. Does everybody see that? What is the lowest cost edge that will not create a cycle? Three. Now, how many times can we go through this iteration? How many iterations can we go through on an n vertex graph? n number of vertices, because each time we're getting a new vertex in our tree, right? In our thing, right? What about another one? Which, uh, what's the next cheapest edge that we can create? OK. What is the next cheapest edge we can consider? Well, what about this one? This is 4. 4 is a great number. What's wrong with 4? It creates a cycle, so we're not going to do 4. Does everybody see that? Next number you say is 5. Five's a good number, but are we going to add that edge? Creates a cycle, OK? Here's one that of length 5, of size 5, that doesn't create a cycle. Does everybody see that? And see how now we are clearly different than prims. It's not like just prims starting from a different place. 
we're building our graph in not disconnected components, right? Now our tree, ha not our tree, our, our, our uh, collection so far is of disconnected components. What do we call something that is a bunch of trees that is not connected? A forest. Does everybody get that idea? Fine. Now, what's the next edge that we can consider adding? And it's of weight 7. Do we want to add this one or this one? Does everybody see that it doesn't matter, right? Let's say I add this one, just to be uh, a little creative here. And now we have, what you call it, a tree. OK? And I claim that Kruskal's algorithm is going to be a minimum spanning tree. Any questions about how Kruskal's algorithm works? Any questions? OK. So my real question now is, if we take a look at Kruskal's algorithm, let me just try these things. Why is it that Kruskal's algorithm works? OK. Can anybody give me a proof? OK. OK. How would we do a proof that Kruskal's algorithm is correct? Yes. So um, if we don't have a cycle. OK, so how are we going to prove it? By induction or contradiction? Contradiction, okay, and what does it mean to prove it by contradiction? If it was false, then we'd have two facts that disagree with each other. Okay, fine, fine. So now how are we going to do it? So um, we claim that if there was a node that wasn't uh, bound, it wasn't connected, or if there was an edge that was uh, not a minimal edge, then somehow we would have not picked the right minimum edge of each. Okay, that that is okay. So again, that's a good try. Okay, but now that that doesn't isn't convincing to me quite yet. You haven't kind of shown me where there's a contradiction. You're saying if I don't do these things, something bad's going to happen. That's like you know listening to your mother or something like that, right? Or you know, um, what what do you try? What would you write? Okay, I, so you're basically going through a, an idea that is basically like the Prim's algorithm idea, and that I think is the right way to go about this. Okay, if Kruskal's algorithm is wrong, what does it mean to be a contradiction? If Kruskal's algorithm is wrong, then there must be a graph where we do it wrong. And if it does it wrong on that graph, there must be a place where it suddenly makes a mistake. Does everybody kind of see that? We could imagine a world where, if we were doing Kruskal's algorithm, okay, what would be the way that we would do it? Okay, we would have our graph here, and I am merrily adding edges. I'm merrily adding edges, and you're saying, eh. On this graph, adding the edges from cheapest to most expensive, given what you've already put in, this is now, adding that edge was the lethal mistake, right? Now there is no way to save yourself. This can't lead to a minimum spanning tree anymore. And I say, oh yeah? Well, why don't you go finish building me this minimum spanning tree? Okay, and it's not going to include this edge, obviously. Let's say it uh, does this, and it's going to include this, and it's going to include that, and, th and that. Adding, okay, that edge, okay, to a minimum span, a spanning tree is going to create what? It's got to create a cycle, right? Now, how do I know if I delete any one of those edges on the cycle, the thing's still going to be connected, right? How do I know that there has to be an edge on that cycle that is of bigger weight then this one, the one that I added with, Krim's, uh, with Kruskal's algorithm, yeah? So 
Does everybody see that? When I was looking to add this, I had the choice of adding any, you know, again, I don't know what was in my tree originally. I think these were the ones that I basically added. But it's clear that when I made this decision to add it, it didn't create a cycle, or else I wouldn't have added it, right? And I chose the minimum edge that would not create a cycle, right? So that means you added edges afterwards, which are of weight at least as big as me, right? So if I delete one of those edges and put this thing in, I get a spanning tree of weight at least no bigger than what you had before. Does everybody see that? And so I couldn't have gone wrong with, 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 with Kruskal's algorithm. OK? Any questions? Yeah? Do these, uh, do these work with directed graphs? Um, it is, mi minimum spanning tree is an undirected graph problem. You would have to come up with a different definition of what it is the thing you want. Maybe you want a uh, notion of a directed graph, okay? And uh, you'd have to think a little bit about what that means, okay? But, you know, but the standard uh, definition of a minimum spanning tree, minimum spanning tree is an undirected graph problem, okay? Any questions? Any questions about why this proof holds? Okay, and why this works? Okay. And again, it's brave to have tried to come up with one now, but does that, do people see how this is a more concrete proof than what we're talking about? It's not like, oh, we did this and nothing happened. There's no way to beat it. The reason there's no, we describe exactly why there's no way to beat it. This edge that I put in is cheaper than one of the edges you put in. I can show you which edge that is. It's one of the ones that's on this cycle that, that, that I didn't put in, OK? And therefore, we have a contradiction. Any questions about that? OK, any questions about why Kruskal's algorithm is right? OK? So how do we implement Kruskal's algorithm? Kruskal's algorithm says, Add edges to the graph in order of cost, OK? And, and then for each edge, test whether, what its cycle is, what the complexity of it is. I mean, wh whether adding this thing creates a cycle. Does everybody see that? So how do we, what are we going to do? We're going to build a, either the easiest thing to do is just to sort all the edges based on weight. Does everybody see that? And now after m log m time, OK, I now have all the edges ordered by weight. I can consider them from cheapest to hardest. What I'm now going to do is one by one consider them in my tree that I'm building and ask whether or not it creates a cycle. Now, how would I tell? Can someone give me an algorithm, OK, using, you know, I've got my partial tree here. Does everybody see that? I've got all the vertices. I've got these things here. How can I tell whether or not adding another edge to the graph is going to create a cycle? Yeah? Is there a route from there? How do I test if there's a route like that? Well, it's not, you're saying one has to be discovered, one has to not be discovered. No. This thing's been discovered. This thing's been discovered. Does everybody see that adding an edge between them is perfectly kosher, right? So I can't do the test like that, OK? Yes? Search for common roots between those two nodes? How is it that I am going to test whether or not a graph has a cycle in it, yeah? Depth first search, didn't we believe that was one of the things that depth first search was created for, right? If we did a depth first search on the graph and we did a back, if I ever found the back edge, that meant it created a cycle. Does everybody see that? How much time is it going to be to take my partial tree on n vertices and add an edge and tell whether I've got a cycle? How much time will that take? O n. 
Why is that ON and not ON plus M? Yeah? The number of edges, it's a tree, right? Or it's even a tree minus, you hacked some things out of the tree. It's a forest, right? So it's got at most n minus 1 edges in it. Does everybody see that? So building the, uh, so, so, so doing a breadth first search, depth first search will take order n time. And so if you understand this, okay, it should be clear that what's this algorithm going to look like? Sort in order m log m time. Then 4i goes from 1 to m, potentially for each edge, right? Do an order n time uh, algorithm to tell whether it created a cycle. If it did create a cycle, throw the edge out. If it didn't, add it to my graph, OK? And if I go through and do that, this is m iterations of n time. The second part is order m times n time. Any questions? What is the total complexity of the, of the algorithm? m log m plus n times m, which is order n times m. Any questions about that? Now, is this disappointing? Let's think about it. Do people see why it's order n times m? And is this disappointing? OK. Why is it disappointing? I told you I wanted this for dense graphs, right? This is no better than the lousy implementation of Prim's algorithm, right? The first part looks like it's sleek, right? Because now if I have a sparse graph, let's say I had order n edges in my sparse graph. This would be n log n for the first part. The second thing is too expensive. Does everybody kind of see that? And if we could do a, a faster job of telling whether we would create a cycle, then I claim if we could instead reduce this time to test whether we have a cycle to log m time, log n time per, per test then this part would be n times log n, right? Does everybody kind of see that? So I need a fast way to make Kruskal's algorithm really fast. I need a faster way to tell whether or not the graph has a cycle in it by adding that edge. Does everybody see that? If I could find a faster way of doing it, suddenly I have the hope of an m log m algorithm. Any questions? Yes? OK, connected list adjacency type of thing. The idea that is going to start to get us there is actually a, sort of a, a descendant of what he was saying. Remember, how did we do this test of whether you were in the fringe? OK, we had basically, for every vertex, OK, we had an array that said whether you were in the tree or not in the tree, right? A, a, a Boolean vector. Are you in the tree or are you not in the tree? And we could add an edge if, we, if one of them was true and one of them was false, right? What if we had a data structure that for our graph maintained the connected components of that thing? So far, this is what we've got. Does everybody agree? We've got this kind of a uh, situation. Suppose for every vertex, we labeled it, not is it in the tree or not in the tree, but with its component number. Does everybody see here now, every vertex has a component number associated with it. Let's say that I have an array that goes from 1 to n. And now for every vertex, tells me what its component number is. Does everybody see that in constant time, I should now be able to look up what its component number is, right? If I had this array of component numbers, how could I use it to tell whether adding an edge would create a cycle? Yes? 
Does everybody see that I get in trouble if I add an edge between two things in the same component? But everything is fine so long as I add an edge between two vertices in different components, right? So with a data structure, if I could have a data structure that maintains this thing, OK, efficiently, then I claim I can do that cycle test quickly, OK? How many people are with me so far? OK? Now, what has to change whenever I add an edge? OK? Suppose I add an edge here to here. What's got to change in my data structure? OK, somebody else is seated. We're alert here. OK, yeah. Does everybody see that now 1 and 4, now the families are married, right? They're kin. OK, I've got to change all of these. I can either change the 4s to a 1 or a 1 to a 4. Does everybody see that? Which would I be better off doing? Changing the force, because there's less of them to change. Does everybody see that? I might as well do it that way. And now change these things, OK? Now, there's a fancy data structure to let you do that kind of merging quickly, which is described in the book that in the interest of moving on, I'm not going to go through it, called the union fine data structure, OK? And it enables you to basically merge sets and let them merge their identity quickly in log n time, OK? And that is the key to making Prim's al Kruskal's algorithm quick. Does everybody see it? The problem of what we're doing here is really reducing to adding edges, testing whether to, finding out whether or not they're in the same component. And once they are in the same component, doing a merge, OK, so that now these two components are the same thing, OK? Any questions about that? Yeah? What was the name of the data structure? The union fine data structure. And it's a, it's a, cool, it's a cool thing, OK? I mean, I, you know, it's in the book. It's not a big deal. But, I, but because I'm running a little behind, I think I'd rather sacrifice the details here to get us into something else, OK? If we have a lot of extra time, I'll go through and do that. But any questions? But does anybody see that if we have this ability to merge sets and maintain being able to ask ourselves, what's, which set is somebody in? That is the key to making this run fast. Any questions? And actually, what, OK, 30-second description of how you do it. OK? The way I am going to do it is by maintaining trees that point towards the root instead of towards the leaves, OK? Suppose that my merging process, what if I want to merge? I have an edge that's going to span between this component and that component. How can, if I have trees, let's say I represent each component by uh, a tree that points with edges going up, how could that help me? I'm going to say the name of my component. <coughs> is going to be the root of the tree that it's in. <coughs> so what's the name of the component that contains 2? 4. What's the name of the component that contains 7? Bop, bop, 4. Does everybody see it? What's the name of the component that contains 3? Nope, 3. What's the name of the component that contains this? 5. Right? Now, suppose I want to merge these two components. How much work do I have to do to merge them? Yeah? If I have a pointer that goes from here to here, does everybody see that every element in this component has a new root? Does everybody see that? Now, what is the, the root of 5 going to be? Bop, bop. OK, and by making that one change, OK, I am going to now be able to update this thing. Does everybody kind of see that? Yeah? How do you ensure that you don't get that worst case linked list? How do I ensure I don't do that worst case linked list type of thing? 
Well, which one do I want to make the root of this thing? OK, do I want to make 3 the root of 4 or 4 the root of 3? Why do I want to make 4 the root of 3? Because it's kind of got more stuff in here. Does everybody kind of see that? If I always merge the, shorter, the, the, the smaller tree into the bigger tree, my claim is that the height of this thing is always going to be log n. OK? Why is that? Because if you think about it, there's the height of the tree. If let's say I was merging, let's say I was merging the shorter tree into the taller tree. Does everybody see that the height of the taller tree doesn't change? The only way it changes is if they are the same size, right? And then basically I take something with a lot of nodes and a lot of nodes and I double and I merge them together only making it one thing larger. Does everybody see that? That's a log doubling kind of idea, right? Does everybody see that? If every time I take something of height n and n and merge it to create something n plus 1, the height only grows when you double it. OK? And I'm waving a little bit of hands, but not much. And you can take a look at the book or the notes and figure that out from here. Any questions about it? Now you've tricked me. I've explained the union fine data structure. OK? And you can look at it, and it's relatively easy to program and stuff like that. Any questions about it? OK? So Kruskal's algorithm is another way of building minimum spanning trees. Union fine data structure is a good thing to know about. OK? And, uh, and it's got a very interesting complexity history if you read the, the book, but I'm not going to tell you that now. Any questions about it? OK, any other questions about minimum spanning trees before I go any further? OK, good. So that's my minimum spanning tree story. Let's now get into, um, OK, sorry about this. Uh, let's say view, uh, full screen. Uh-oh, trouble. Talk to me. Talk to me. OK, sorry about that. Let's see what's going on here. Hold on. Sorry about this. This is seemingly what more. OK, let's focus. Focus. OK, good. Boom. OK, so now. Um, I'd like to move on. Any other questions about minimum spanning trees before we go on there? OK. Now, the daily problem revolved around minimum spanning trees a little bit, right? Let's Now I think we're ready to deal with the daily problem. So I'm sorry, I'm a little behind. But it says here, suppose we are given a minimum spanning tree of a graph, where the graph had n vertices and m edges, and a new edge we're going to add to the graph. Give me an efficient algorithm to find the minimum spanning tree of the new graph, the, meaning the old graph plus the new edges, edge, such that it runs in order n time. But slower algorithms will receive credit. OK? Could anyone give me a slow algorithm for solving this problem? OK? You give me the minimum spanning tree of a graph. I give you another edge. Now find me a, a minimum spanning tree of the new graph with the new edge. Yeah. Right. Does everybody see? I always have the prop ability to add the new ed edge to the graph and find the minimum spanning tree of it by Kruskal or Prims. OK? But it seems like I've wasted something here. I had a perfectly good spanning, minimum spanning tree, and I threw it away. Right? How can I update it now, my minimum spanning tree, in light of an edge? Yes, you. Greater than I replace what? OK, so the key question that you're saying is that that seems perfectly reasonable. You tell me so far, here is my minimum spanning tree. OK. And I am going to add another edge. OK. 
what will, under what conditions will, what will I do with this edge? I now add this graph to the tree. What is the details of what I'm going to do with it? Yeah? Okay, is there going to be, if this is UV, if this is my new edge, is there a path in the tree from U to V without this edge? By definition, because in any pair of vertices in a tree, there's going to be a, uh, uh, what you call a path. What do I want this path to be? Okay, what do I want to do with this path now, yeah? Which edge should I get rid of? Does everybody agree that, I, that I'm going to look at the path between these two vertices and the new edge that I've added? The biggest of these edges gets tossed. Does everybody see that? How do I find that path, and how do I deal, you know, do the bookkeeping in order and time, yeah? Step for, search. Step for search for what? This is just finding a cycle, right? The graph has only one cycle in it. Do a depth first search. And the moment I add the edge to the graph, do a depth first search, there's going to be a back edge. Now I ask myself, what's the weight of the back edge? What's the weight of every edge from the parent? From the, you know, if it, the edge goes from x to y, from y to x, go through these parent, parent, parent. The biggest of these edges is the one that gets tossed. Does everybody see that? And that everybody see this can be done in order and time. Because the cost is basically that of doing the depth first search on a graph, a sparse graph with only n edges in it. Any questions about that? Yes? Would taking an edge out affect the weight of any other edge? The answer is no, because the weights of edges in a, in a, in a minimum spanning tree depend upon nothing else, right? Does everybody kind of see? that the weight of the edges are a given. It's no more costly, the value of the cost of this edge or the implication of this edge. Has, none of the other edges have any implication on that, right? Edge weights are fixed. The minimum spanning tree is the tree of edges whose weights sum to the minimum. So there is no combinatorial thing going on here, OK? Any questions? Any other questions about minimum spanning trees? OK. So what I'd like to talk about now and for the rest of our graph theory unit, which is this class and next class, um, I would like to talk about the problem of finding shortest paths in graphs. OK? Why in, might we want to take a weighted graph and find the shortest path in a graph? OK? Yes. Navigation, this is your GPS, right? You want to find the shortest way to drive between here and Poughkeepsie, OK? You have a graph of roads, OK? There is an edge, a travel time on each road. Find the, the path of minimum cost, OK? So that is shortest path. Are there other things you want to do with shortest path? So my main lesson for the next 20 minutes is not going to be so much algorithmic, but is cultural, OK? Why do you want to compute shortest paths, OK? Because shortest path computations are amazingly useful things outside just transportation, OK? Why else? Can anybody else think of any reason why you want to do a shortest path? Yes. What? Phone networks. So you're saying, why would you want a shortest path in a communications network? OK, so if you're assuming that uh, if you have a phone network, OK, and you know what you call it, uh, if you have a phone network and every wire has a certain amount of time to travel across, you would want to find the connection between you and the person you're calling with the smallest total cost, because that's going to be the smallest lag, right? Has anybody ever called overseas and you say, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, right? Does everybody heard that one? So in some sense, to minimize that would be to find the shortest path through the network, OK? That's, that I think I can believe, OK? Any other cases you want to find shortest paths? When you've got a bunch of servers and you're trying to serve a download from the closest one over a network? 
So you can imagine there's a download thing that, again, this is more of a kind of communications network thing. You're trying to pirate a movie, and the p movie's on several different servers, right? You want to be able to buy, download it as quickly as possible, and so you want to find which server is closest to you in communication space, okay? So that would be a shortest path kind of a thing, yeah. Traveling and connecting flights. So you're right. One question would be a lot of scheduling thing. What is the fastest way for me to get between here and um, uh, you know, our, uh, Australia? Perhaps to talk to the relative I couldn't speak to very well on the phone, right? You could imagine that there is a problem here where there's connecting flights that have to happen. And it's a little bit more, recognize it's, uh, it's not quite as simple as you think, actually. You might be thinking that the network for air travel is it consists of cities, okay, and that you want to fly between here, New York, and Australia, and you could say, well, I can take a flight from here to Boston, and that Boston I can fly to Philly, and Philly has a direct flight to, you know, Turkey, and Turkey has a direct flight to, to London, and London, you can go straight to Australia. We could, th you might be thinking about that as a Graph on the cities. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Is finding the fastest way to fly between here and our, you know, uh, another place find the, a gra defined by the graph on the cities? The network on the cities? Again, we're kind of picturing a graph where there's a, 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 a graph where the vertices are cities and there's an edge if there is a flight between those cities, right? That's kind of what I'm picturing the graph is. Does that tell you the fastest way to get between here and there? Why not? Well, one possibility is there could be multi-edges. There could be, it's like a multi-graph. Does everybody kind of see that? That's one issue. So it's not a simple graph. There's lots of ways of flying between here and Boston directly, right? But that's not my only problem. What else is there? One flight leaves before the other one does. Does everybody kind of see that? Now we've got a problem that it's not just a, gra a flight between places. Okay, does everybody kind of see that? Okay, because certain flights, if I'm going to try to catch, if there's a great flight from here to Australia that leaves at 5 p.m., can I take one that gets me into Boston at 5.05 p.m.? No, because I'm going to miss that flight. Does everybody see that? So how can we make this a shortest path problem? This is actually the kind of thinking that I think is, is an important thing. Remember, at one point I told you I'm afraid to design graph algorithms. I'm terrified to design graph algorithms. But I would like to design graphs that do what I want so that I can use a graph algorithm somebody knows about, right? So what would my graph be? OK, yeah, you. Topology traversal. I, I'm going to say I want to do a shortest path thing. I need a graph. What kind of a graph do I want? Maybe I have a node for each flight to a city. Let me tell you how I would do this one. Okay. What if I have a node represent? Let's say I have a node that represents. Let's say my node is going to be. N sub i j, it's not an edge, a node is going to have two names on it. One is going to be what is the city, and the other is going to be the time slash date. So every node in my position, if you think about it, every node might be a, a position in space time. Remember Einstein talking about space time? Steven Skeena is at this location at this time, right? And if he moves at the speed of light, he can be someplace else at a different time. But there's places I can't be, right? Because I can't travel fast enough. What if my nodes, each node meant a, a combination of being in a city at a particular time, maybe a particular hour of the day, right? And then now there's a question. Is there a flight between this city, I, and city J at a particular time a certain amount in the future, right? If from this point 
I can take that plane and get to this city at that time, that would be my edge. Does everybody see that? And then kind of traveling and finding the shortest path in that graph would give me something about the fastest way to fly. How many people see what I'm saying here? Okay. So there's a powerful thing going on, which is that, again, when you, how do you use graph algorithms in practice? It's about designing the right graph to convey what you want. Okay. And then shortest path in the proper guise is, prob is often the right thing you want to do on the right graph. Okay. Any questions about that? There's some other applications. One application that came on, I had a former student who was working in the animation industry. And he, you know, he, was, he was building video games. He had these characters in the background. And he was saying, well, why don't you have these, character, these characters? I have them randomly programmed to walk around in the background. But they look really dumb. Because all they're doing is kind of doing things like this. Okay? And it doesn't look like they're really there for a reason. So what did I say? Well, give them a place to go. Start them in one place, have them start in another place, find the shortest path between them, and have them go there. And then they'll look like they've got something to do, right? You guys are going to go to a class after this. You're going to take the shortest path. You're going to look like you have something to do, right? OK? What I want to tell you is, again, the, the, the big picture, that may not be a great example. The big picture is that a lot of problems reduce to finding shortest paths if you build the right graph. Any questions about that? Let me show you another example, one of the war stories in the book that was shortest path on the right graph, OK? And we had a project we worked on. Um, you know, you guys I know have your cell phones, and you like to type in there. And, and, um, and the, the, especially on landline phones, you know there's only 12 key, the keys. There's only the, the, the 0 through 9 buttons on your landline phone, right? And you want to be able to enter text on a telephone. How do you do it? You've noticed that on a telephone, they have these, like on the, on the button for two, it has the letters A, B, C written on it. Does everybody notice this? That there's ambiguity. We wanted to build a system that you could type a message on a telephone. And we would guess which of the three letters you meant to type, OK? You could imagine a asking, typing it twice so that you get a correction. Like, uh, OK, push 2, it means an A, B, or a C. And I'll push another button to correct, tell you which one of those three it was. I wanted to build a system where I could type in, and in this case, just a stream of phone tokens. And I would interpret it as words, OK? And reconstruct what was the text that you meant to type on it. Does everybody get an idea what my problem was? So how did I solve this problem? The answer is shortest path. You say, well, wait, what's shortest path? Shortest path only makes sense if you have the right graph. What is a graph that we could build on these phone token things in order to make it so that we could interpret things as words? OK, actually, let me see if there's anything else I had in mind here. Basically, we did the following. We assumed that the space character was the hash key, OK? And anything between hash keys would be, uh, what you call it, a word. We could look up in the dictionary all the, by using this, these numbers can be thought of as being hash codes for a word, actually, right? Let's call this the pound sign so I don't overuse the word hash. We could think of these numbers as being hash codes for a word. It turns out that the word boy hashes to the same word as box and cow and any if you use a standard telephone. So there might be many words that correspond to that set of symbols. Does everybody kind of get that idea? What is the graph that I'm going to want to build? I'm going to build a graph where my vertices are going to be word interpret possible word interpretations. And I'm going to have an edge between word interpretations of neighboring words. And what would I want the weight of those word interpretations to be? Yeah? How likely, the word is How likely it is that the second word is related to this. Does every, you know, uh, so for example, again, you can't read it from here. 
But this, this was give and hive were the same words. And this was like me and what else was there? Did anybody read it? Me and there was another word of length. Too. It's in the book. Somebody who has the book can tell me. I know some people were reading the book during my lecture. Okay? But does everybody kind of get the idea that if I had separate word, if I had all the possible word interpretations between every pair of them, if I knew something about how likely they were to want to be next to each other, I could assign a cheaper cost to wedge vertices that are, word pairs that are neighbor, that are commonly near each other than rarely near each other. Does everybody see that? How could I figure out if a word pair likes to be next to each other? Anybody think of a way? Yeah? If I look at every, if I go through a, a large amount of text, I can count how many times have these words been next to each other, right? And give me has occurred a lot more often than have, hive me, correct? Okay. And now what is my solution going to be? I claim I've got a weighted graph that goes from left to right, okay, in this model. I claim that the shortest path through this graph is going to be a logical interpretation of those words as a sentence. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, and this worked very, very well. We got like 99% of the characters right when we did it this way. Okay, any questions about that? You can read the details in a war story. Okay, but I want this to be a kind of a lesson that there's a large problem, set of problems in the world where, okay, basically we are finding shortest paths on the right graph, okay? And that's why that's got to be a, a thing you want to do. Any questions about it? Any questions about this, this application? One warning, and again, two warnings. We still have time, so don't get nervous, okay? Don't leave so fast. Later on, in, a, in, in a, not the next unit, but the unit after this is going to be about something called dynamic programming. And shortest path algorithms have connections with this technique called dynamic programming, which has to do about storing partial results. Basically, we solve this one by basically finding shortest paths, but using a dynamic programming version of shortest path. Okay, because this graph, all the edges here went from left to right. Does everybody kind of see it that all the edges go from one word to the next word, right? If you have a directed graph where all the edges go from left to right, what do we know about that graph? Okay, if we have a directed graph where all edges go from left to right, what do we know about that graph? Yeah? That, 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 that it has a topological sort which means that it was a directed acyclic graph. Does everybody see that? So this was shortest path on a special kind of graph that was a directed acyclic graph. So we might do it a little differently because it's a very, uh, very special kind of a thing. Okay? And that's going to be related to things that we do in dynamic program. Okay? Just to, to file that away for future reference. Any questions? Any questions about how this phone system works and how, why we should be inspired to compute shortest paths? Okay, what do we know about computing shortest paths? You know something about computing shortest paths now. How do you compute shortest paths that you know about? Is there anything we've done here to show you how to compute shortest paths? Yeah? Breadforth search was good for finding shortest paths in what kind of graphs? Not undirected, but unweighted. I mean, breadth for search, depth, breadth for search would work fine on directed graphs, but it required having an unweighted graph where every vertex, every edge had weight one, every edge had the same weight. Does everybody see it? Now, the problem on weighted graphs is that the shortest distance between two points might not involve the fewest number of edges. Does everybody get that idea? How many people here have some, short, some shortcut they know of that they treasure? Okay. Now, is your shortcut, yeah, just stay on 347. No, your shortcut is going to be what? Turn off here, turn off there, drive through this guy's lawn, and you, you've got it, right? Does everybody get that? It involves making a lot of, you know, 
typically involves having a lot of different edges involved on that. But the total distance is less because in a weighted graph, <coughs> we could have a long edge. I mean, you know, one edge could involve, uh, have a high weight on it, meaning it's going to cost us a lot in a weighted path. Any questions? So the first thing to know about shortest paths that's going to be important is that, um, that in an unweighted graph, OK, we could use breadth-first search to find the shortest path from one node to any other node. And that would be linear time. It should also be clear why breadth-first search will not work in weighted graphs. Because the shortest weighted path might use very few hops. Any questions? The other thing I want to convince you of is that we're not going to want to report all shortest paths between two nodes in general. Why not? Because I want to claim that there can be a lot of them. OK, let me give you an example of a graph where there's a lot of them. OK, what if I had a simple, in fact, even an acyclic graph where it looked like this. I had these wedge units here. Does everybody see it? And I'm going to have a lot of them chained together. Suppose every edge was of weight 1. What's the shortest path from here to here? If every edge has weight 1, what's the shortest path from there to there, from S to source to the destination? How, what's the shortest path? Yeah. Well, there's, OK, at how many paths there are? Everybody sees that the shortest path itself is one, two, three, four, five, six edges long, right? But how many shortest paths are there? Eight, because you can go up or down, up or down, up or down. Does everybody see that if I string any of these units along, how many different shortest paths are there going to be? Two to the end. Does everybody see that? So if you say, hey, I got a great algorithm. I can list all the shortest paths here between these two nodes. And it runs in n plus m time. You've got to realize you're talking nonsense. Does everybody see that? So we're going to be looking for an algorithm that is going to generate a shortest path, but not necessarily all shortest paths. Any questions about it? Any other questions about We sort of started talking about shortest paths now. Anything else related to that? OK, next class we're going to look at Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest paths and hopefully a related algorithm called Floyd, uh, Floyd's. It's, just, it's just also interesting. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you guys next class.